Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you all for being here. So 6.31, I just wanted to kick off um, by acknowledging that we are all meeting today on Aboriginal land. Um, I'm here on the lands of the Yagara and Turbal people in South Brisbane, and I want to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Yeah, so thanks for being here. I, my name is Emily Kane. I'm a community organiser with the Queensland Community Alliance, and I'll be uh, chairing the Civic Academy on energy transitions tonight. So tonight, the Civic Academies came about um, in order to try and develop the policy knowledge among Alliance leaders and in our Alliance institutions. And so the kind of three aims that we've got tonight and with all of the Civic Academies that we're running is to develop the policy knowledge among Alliance leaders, to build on the Maroon Print vision and principles for Queensland Reconstruction. So there's a link to the Maroon Print just here. And later on tonight, Dave is going to take us through some specific policy asks that we've developed out of the Maroon Print that we're going to be taking to the state election. Um, and also to increase the ambition and imagination around uh, public policy. So what is actually possible, what is needed, um, and how can we kind of get there? So I'm going to hand over now to Claire Galvin from the Australian Youth Climate Coalition to share about why she's active on climate and uh, what that means for her and her community. Thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, so I guess I have grown up in Cairns. Um, I recently moved to Brisbane, but yeah, done most of my community organising in Cairns, which is a regional city in far north Queensland. Um, and it's on the doorstep of the Great Barrier Reef and Daintree Rainforest, which is a pretty incredible place to grow up. And I remember my first time I visited the reef, I was just one. Um, and the first time I went snorkeling, I still remember that like beautiful awestruck feeling I had of just looking at a completely different world underwater. It was incredible. Um, and it never really leaves you. Um, for a bit of background about Cairns, it's home to a really large tourism and hospitality industry. And it's where myself and a lot of my mates worked in casual jobs. But Cairns isn't just sunshine and the reef, even though that makes up quite a bit of it. It has and will continue to experience a lot of really severe climate impacts. Um, and one of my earliest memories as a child was when I was around five years old. I woke up to torrential rain and huge gusts of wind. It, and that was because a Category 5 cyclone had just hit Far North Queensland. And so I sat with my family huddled under a wooden table that we'd pulled out into the middle of the house in the hopes that it would protect us um, if the cyclone blew our roof off. And I guess back then my childlike innocence kind of stopped me from really understanding the severity of that situation. But then several years later, my family had to pack our bags and evacuate our house because yet another Category 5 cyclone was about to hit the far north. Um, and those impacts don't, aren't just limited to that. Um, in the past five years, I've watched the Great Barrier Reef experience three mass coral bleaching events. And this just isn't normal. It's fueled by climate change, um, as is the increasing severity of cyclones plus other extreme weather events. So earlier this year, Cairns experienced um, the most recent and widespread mass coral bleaching. Um, and not long after that, coronavirus hit our region. And living in Cairns, you kind of get used to the hustle and bustle that comes with it. Um, tourists are always rushing to dive, like board dive boats and locals are dining in at cafes. But as social distancing became increasingly more important, uh, my hospitality job cut back on my shifts and my mates who worked in the dive industry were temporarily laid off and had to find other ways to pay the rent. So I guess it's predicted that tourism dependent centres like Cairns will be one of the last places um, in regional Queensland to recover from the impacts of this pandemic. But that's not actually taking into account the increasingly frequent and severe impacts of climate change and the impact that that has on regions like my hometown and other tourism driven economies like ours. So if we think about it, if regional places like Cairns are to thrive in the future, we need to stop fueling climate change, like that's it. And that looks like transitioning away from fossil fuels and towards that clean renewable energy future that can create, you know, hundreds of jobs for our regions. Um, and I guess that's why this section of the Maroon Print for Queensland Reconstruction is, reconstruction is and so important. And it's why, you know, campaigning for a renewable energy superpower package, package is critical. Um, and yeah, that's what we'll be hearing about today. 
So I know I'm looking forward to hearing more about what all that entails. Um, and thanks for listening to my story. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for sharing and for being on the call this evening. I would now like to hand over to Tim Buckley to talk finance. No more stories here. Uh, so Tim Buckley is the Director of Energy Finance Studies Australia South Asia um, with the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. So um, we'll hear from Tim for about 10 minutes and then end with Amanda. So over to you, Tim. Right. Good evening, everyone. So uh, thank you, Emily. And I might just try and share my screen. So hopefully that will work. Great, we gotcha. That's coming up, is it? I actually can't see it. So uh, let me know if it disappears, Emily. Um, okay, will do. Great. So um, IEFA is a public interest think tank. Uh, we're global. We've now got maybe 35 staff and most of us are financial analysts and we work on the nexus of the energy, finance and climate space. And uh, I'm going to talk primarily about the Queensland energy transition, but I'm going to give you some global context and take you through a few quick points and then we can... Um, debate those later on in this evening. So the, the first point I would make is that renewable energy is enormously deflationary and it's a point which has um, been amazing over the last decade. I think we are still going to see dramatic changes over the coming decade. So it's very much I would call it an unfair fight. For a decade we've been waiting for renewables to be commercially viable globally. They are, as of today, absolutely commercially viable. So it's about trying to stop all of the subsidies of fossil fuels and just free the playing field so that commercially viable zero subsidy renewables can actually compete fairly and they will absolutely win this fight, I have no doubt. Um, and the deflation more recently, you'll see in the pink slide, the battery storage. Um, so our government's gone from talking about how renewables are too expensive, we can't afford the subsidies. Now they say, oh, but we have to worry about the intermittency of it. Batteries aren't competitive, batteries aren't viable. Well, batteries are very, very rapidly coming down the, um, up the learning curve, up the economies of scale curve and free falling in prices. And I was just reading over the weekend, the biggest battery in the world up and operational today is the Tesla Hornsdale Battery Reserve down in South Australia. In America, they announced a battery 10 times as big over the weekend, 10 times as big as the biggest battery in the world. It'll be operational in two years time. So massive technology improvement, massive economies of scale, massive ongoing deflation. Uh, the International Energy Agency, the IEA, made some very interesting comments a couple of months ago that during COVID, probably to me the key one is that it could well prove to be that 2019 was absolutely the peak for fossil fuel usage globally across all fossil fuels. Now, it's still not the mainstream thinking, but um, it's... The trends in 2020, for all that COVID's been horrific for most people, it's actually been dramatically um, positive for the energy transition because it's really trying to make people think about the nexus between accepting science. The COVID is all about accepting the science of health issues and this is about accepting the science relating to climate as we just heard about. The uh, Third point to make is that a lot of global companies are now buying into the idea that this transition is inevitable, it's necessary, and if they don't, they will be destroyed. And so the latest range of companies to announce huge transition plans are the European oil and gas majors. Likewise, finance is moving dramatically and we're seeing new announcements every week by finance to exit coal. So coming down back to Queensland, coal is 
Coking coal is a major export from Queensland, the number one export other than tourism, a major commodity export of um, Queensland along with LNG. But this chart shows the price for thermal coal. Coking coal prices have been moving the same. But one point I would mention very, very specifically for this audience is that we hear about coal all the time. What we really should be talking about when we're in Queensland is talking about coking coal for steel production. 80% of Queensland's coal exports are coking coal. That is not yet technologically challenged by renewables. It's not yet. It will be, but we've probably got another two decades that Queensland will supply half the world's coking coal. New South Wales is very much a thermal coal sector and that is very much structurally and cyclically challenged. Um, so when people talk about coal being in terminal decline, when I talk about coal being in terminal decline, I'm talking about thermal coal, which is a very small part of the Queensland industry. Now, one aspect of Queensland that you will have heard me talk about potentially is Gadamadani. Gadamadani is trying to build the world's largest new thermal coal mine in the Galilee. Now, I've just said coking coal is not structurally challenged yet. Thermal coal is categorically challenged. Gadamadani for a decade now is trying to push his opening up of the Galilee. But what you don't hear in the Australian press is that Gadamadani had an epiphany at the start of this year and he realized he did an op-ed on LinkedIn. Uh, you're welcome to these slides and have a look at, there's a link in the slide to his op-ed. But his op-ed said, in a nutshell, that renewable prices have dropped by 99% in the last four decades and that they'll drop another 99% in the next four decades. Now, you never read about that in the Murdoch press. You never read about it when we're talking to our Australian Federal Energy Minister, Angus Taylor. You never hear about that from Matt Canavan. But Katama Dani has already moved. The chair price chart, I don't expect you to be able to read it, but his, Adani is now the biggest investor in renewables in India. His company, Adani Green, is up a thousand percent in the last three years. It's now worth eight billion US dollars and it absolutely overshadows his legacy coal assets. So if you think Gautam Adani epitomizes that the transition's not happening, you need to actually read what Gautam Adani says because Gautam Adani absolutely talks about energy transition being inevitable and that renewables will win this fight very, very rapidly and his capital is going in that way. Um, again, don't take my word for it. Have a look at what the equity market is telling you. So this is Coronado Global Resources. It's a thermal and coking coal company listed in Australia. It listed three years ago, its shares are down 75%. You know, that's, they've destroyed 75% of shareholder wealth in just three years. Likewise, this is Chesapeake Energy. This is the America's largest gas company. Now, you'll see the share price chart ends in June. That's because it went bankrupt at the end of June. Now, when our federal energy minister talks about the brilliant gas-fired recovery Australia needs to have, and he talks about how gas transformed America and how gas is transforming Queensland. What he fails to acknowledge is that the gas fracking revolution has been an absolute disaster for shareholders in America and for shareholders in Australia. Last point, last slide is there are huge opportunities for Australia and there are huge opportunities for Queensland. We're about to release a report on Gladstone and the potential huge uplift in transforming the Australian heavy industry sector, decarbonising it, driving costs down by renewable energy and integrating it and taking a precinct view and reinvigorating Australian manufacturing, understanding the energy security, national security, climate commitments and investment and jobs. All of those agendas go together and Australia has a huge opportunity, a once in a generation opportunity to transform our country, our nation and refocus on industries, low emission industries of the future. So I will stop there. That report will be out in a couple of weeks time and it'll be all of our research is available. 
um, free on our internet. So you're welcome to grab a copy of that. And these slides are available if anyone wants them. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, and well done keeping to time as well. Um, so one thing that I forgot to say before Tim started speaking is that we will have time in small groups for you to start thinking about questions for our speakers. Um, and so just kind of like hold them in your head and start thinking about um, what some questions you might have later on. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Dr. Amanda Carl from the CEO of Next Economy. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me, Emily and QCA. Um, I'm going to take a slightly uh, different tack, but build on what Tim's been talking about. Um, for the last 12 months, um, the Next Economy has been running a whole lot of events across regional Queensland to talk about how changes in the energy sector are impacting on regional areas, but also where the economic opportunities are in embracing that transition. So we've met currently over 450 people on at the last count from Toowoomba, South Burnett in the south to Gladstone and Rockhampton, central Queensland and up to Townsville and Cairns. Um, and we've met with quite a wide range of people. So we've had kind of closed door invite only workshops with um, industry and government. And when I say industry, I'm talking about heavy industry, the resources sector, manufacturers, other local businesses, agriculture, as well. Um, and then we've had a whole lot of community forums in which there's been environment union groups, um, social services organisations, as well as general community members attend. And what we've been doing is trying to map out what the economic opportunities are, if people can actually embrace what's going on. And the good news is that despite what the media might say, um, regional Queensland is all over this, and there's actually a lot of really exciting projects happening across the board. So if we start with, um, so in talking about it in terms of energy jobs, um, there's a lot of things happening, particularly in central Queensland and up and around Townsville around large scale renewable energy projects, whether they are solar, wind, um, pumped hydro projects, but also um, regional areas really looking at how they can invest in new areas like hydrogen manufacturing for an export industry, battery manufacturing, we've got small scale engineering firms starting to build renewable energy parts in places like Mackay, for example. But the, the energy jobs go much further than this. So there's a lot of jobs in things like energy efficiency and retrofitting households, um, but also starting to manufacture using renewable energy. So often when people are talking about jobs in this area, they focus on the construction jobs immediately around renewable energy. But the really exciting things that are happening is the questions around what opportunities renewable energy opens up as a cheap form of energy to boost other economic sectors in the regions. So um, once I really highly recommend the report that Tim was talking about with Gladstone. So I think it's a really interesting one talking about how renewable energy, and there's a lot of renewable energy in and around Gladstone at the moment, can actually maintain that kind of industrial um, economy that Gladstone has in place and actually boost that into the future. Um, there's also been some really interesting work around green metals. So the opportunity now with renewable energy and the fact that we've got a lot of different minerals in especially the northwest part of the state and how we can use renewable energy to process that locally. So instead of just exporting our coking coal overseas, how can we use renewable energy to produce green metal, for example? What does it mean for our aluminium smelter in Gladstone? or other metals that we've got. But it goes beyond that too. So there's jobs in transport. We've got a lot of jobs, um, a lot of work to do in terms of transforming our transport sector and electrifying that in the regions. Talk around high-speed rail, for example, but also agriculture. So not just reducing emissions, but actually starting to absorb emissions by changing the way that we farm and we manage our land. So the interesting thing is we talk about this often as there's a lot of plans that climate groups put out. But the interesting thing is that there's regional groups and also industry groups are also leading the way. So for example, cattle farming, there's a lot of talk um, around the fact that there's a lot of emissions from, from cows. Um, but actually it's the Meat and Livestock Association has a net um, a carbon neutral target by 2030. And that's being put into place already in central Queensland. 
So the interesting thing about this, and I think this is where we're going to be talking about in a minute, is how do we talk about this in regional areas? Well, the first thing is starting with where we're at because there's already a lot happening that goes under the radar, but actually starting to talk to people and getting them to map out what's already happening in the local area is a really empowering way to start. The other thing um, I think really surprised me was how angry people are on the ground generally. There's been a real shift since the bushfires um, that people actually do want to see the plan. They're seeing renewable energy rolling out across the state. They know what needs to happen, but they want to see it managed and they actually want government to take action to coordinate that discussion, move it forward. They want to see how we can have good renewable energy, how we actually have good jobs that are long term and have decent work conditions attached to that. They want to see good regulation around the environment um, and they want to see public control of our electricity system. Queensland's in a unique um, position that we do still have government owned um, electricity up to 60% of it and Queenslanders want to keep that control over that. So what we've been seeing is people are ready for action and they're accepting that renewable energy is here but they also want to see those benefits flowing to regions. So if we've got a lot of renewable energy, why aren't we seeing power prices fall, for example? We want to see the new industries and the jobs that are attached to it, and we want to see that resilience into the future. And I'm just going to leave that there as a provocation for the discussion. Cool, thanks, Amanda. Um, so we're going to have time for discussion in a second, but before we do that, I'm going to hand over to Dave Coatman to talk through exactly what are we advocating for in the Alliance and why have we landed on that? and then we'll hear from you in small groups. Thanks, Emily. And should I share my screen with these slides or are you going to do that? I would love for you to do that. I was going to do it, but I need to put everyone in breakout groups. So if you could do it, that would okay. be sweet. I will do that. Um, hang on, i got to work out how to do it right. Um, uh, okay, trying to do that. got to work out where the screen is. Mm. Okay, uh, this, slide that I wanted to show you has things. Here we go. That. All right, good. The, the asks that we've got to put up, so I'm just going to share these with you now. Uh, here we go. Okay. Um, so basically there's, there's five or six asks that we're going to be going through. Uh, Um, the first one, yep, this is the second one. This is the first one that we're going to be asking for, I think, or is it the fifth? Not first one. Is uh, three renewable energy zones. We can uh, see your screen, Dave, so maybe I will just share my screen. Oh, uh, okay. No, hang on. Here we go. There we go. We nailed it. Great. Um, so the first thing we're going to ask for is three renewable energy zones in the Darling Downs, Fitzroy, and North Queensland. Um, renewable energy zones are energy policy is incredibly complicated and a mess. And um, it's been a mess because of federal politics. Um, there's a range of structures that regulate and govern how large scale energy works. Um, and because of that, there, there's a limit to new investment in large scale renewable energies in, in Queensland and across Australia because the, the climate emission subsidies that were there for them have ended the, the renewable energy um, subsidies. But the Australian energy um, market operator, um, AEMO, which is designed with kind of working out how the future of energy supply um, will be delivered for across Australia, at least for the, the East Coast and South Australia, um, have basically said the future for our energy is going to be these renewable energy zones. Now, what they are is areas where a number of large solar farms and wind farms can all connect to the national grid and provide energy we need with common resources, like a common transmission line that allows them to all connect in so they're not building their own connections to the grid, but also other things like a large battery or a synchronous condenser that allows the power that goes into the grid to effectively function with the grid without overheating it, overloading it, or causing other problems. And that's because we have a grid that's not designed for a bunch of renewable energy. It's designed for big coal power plants but we need it to change. And so we're changing it bit by bit. And these renewable energy zones are the way of doing it. It's creating an area where renewable energy can connect easily. 
a lot of large-scale wind and solar proponents will tell you they don't need subsidies anymore because of Tim's report, the price is down so low. What they need is an easy connection to the grid and they need a place where they can sell their energy to. And so this would get going with what we want in terms of renewable energy in Queensland. A lot of extra renewable energy it would make for cheap prices. The problem is um, there's a failure of planning and they're not planned to happen for 10 years in Queensland, partly because there's no federal money, partly because there's not a clear plan from the state government and they're happening like crazy in New South Wales. New South Wales is burning ahead with this. They've got the Central Western Renewable Energy Zone. They had um, nine times the number, the amount of capacity bid for. So we need the Queensland government to move quickly or they're gonna miss out. And we need the Queensland government to spend 300 million to do the planning and to start building some of that common infrastructure, the transmission lines and the batteries. And that will mean that these areas have the renewable power that allows them to, to keep the industry there that Amanda was talking about. Um, there are other ways of doing it. Individual companies can build their own giant power plants like um, Sun Metals has done. Uh, but realistically, that's the least efficient way to do it. And it doesn't work for smaller companies. It, you know, you've got to be a giant kind of fairly wealthy company with a long-term investment who's willing to do that. And so this allows ordinary companies, ordinary kind of industry things to get on board and get renewable energy at a cheap price. We need the state government to step up. We also need the federal government to pay their fair share because they're given to New Zealand, New South Wales, two billion, they're given us nothing. So that's the first piece. The second piece is we need, if we want to keep government ownership of, of electricity, we need the two um, of the three uh, generator companies in Queensland, Stanwell and CS Energy, to be allowed to also construct renewable energy. The Queensland government set up Cleanco and they basically said it will be the only renewable energy company for the first bit. But these two other companies are desperate because they know otherwise they're going to be left with legacy assets that, that, that are going to be worthless. They are desperate to transition across and that will mean they'll be able to access new money and revenue and borrowing to be able to put into this. So we need their mandates to be changed. This is currently with the energy minister and the treasurer. No one's quite sure why it's taking so long, but it needs to happen. And everyone in government wants it to happen. They've just got to push it over the line. Uh, and we want them to invest enough to build an extra gigawatt of uh, renewable energy, which is the same as Clean Co has been commissioned by its mandate to do so. Um, the, so the third piece, and I'm going to race through these, that we're doing is we want, as well as these large scale um, renewable energy zones and this large scale renewable energy built by the the generators, and those things could overlap. So the generators could build new solar and wind in those renewable energy zones. And in fact, that would make sense if we want it to be publicly owned renewable energy. We also want distributed energy. Now, lots of Queensland has the highest uptake of solar. We've got a huge amount of solar on our roofs, but solar without storage doesn't work, like it works and it's taken the edge off our demand, but it runs into problems. And so what we need is actually storage that's distributed. Um, South Australia has had a really innovative model of doing this where they've subsidised households to put um, Tesla battery packs or other battery packs on their homes. And what they do is they set up as a virtual power plant. So that means that the company that installs it can kind of access some of your battery. And so what they do is they, it fills up with your solar when the sun's shining and when they don't need it. But when the price in electricity spikes, they can take some of the power from the battery and stabilise the grid. Um, and the price spikes because there's increased demand. So it's a way to make sure that there's a, a system that works. Now, this has been really effective in South Australia. It's led to two battery assembly factories being set up in South Australia. So it actually creates industry jobs. The, there's a potential for the same here. The third, third piece, fourth piece, is really trying to make sure that the renewable energy, now it's cheaper. We want any, everyone to benefit from it. So the people who've really missed out from the benefits of, it's not me, middle class, own my own home, I've got five um, kilowatt system on my roof, haven't paid a bill for, for four years. But if you're in social housing, you often have a huge bill. Um, we think that we, they could get social, on one third of um, public housing or social housing in Queensland, they could install solar. Um, and it would be a huge benefit for those people. It would save them lots of money, it would create jobs, it would create stimulus. Um, but it would really also be a really energy efficient way to work. And then for other people who aren't in social housing, uh, so in social housing, we think the government just pays for it. 
In the other areas, we think that they do what they did three years ago, which is offer an interest free loans for solar and storage for households to install solar and batteries in priority areas for energy demand. So there's a bunch of areas where Energex or Ergon desperately needs there to be a little bit more storage and supply. And in those areas, if they expanded these loan schemes, it would be a really cheap way to encourage economic activity, to encourage more batteries and solar. Um, you actually don't even need to now give people a subsidy for solar. You just need to give them some no interest loans and it, it pays off in the time that they need. And then the sixth one, I think this is my last. Yes, uh, if I go back, oh, if I go back. The sixth one is actually not around solar energy. It's around other forms of energy efficiency. And this is uh, a short extension of the subsidies that are currently available for energy efficient uh, appliances. So at the moment this exists, you can get about $200 for a peak smart air conditioning refrigerator, sorry, air conditioning. And they did have a scheme for washing machines and refrigerators, and there is currently a subsidy for heat pumps. We think if they, for a short period of time, they increase that subsidy, it will increase economic activity, but also it'll massively reduce the amount of energy that people use. And it's like the second fridge, the bar fridge, that's often incredibly inefficient. A subsidy like this that allows people to buy something new will massively decrease the amount of energy they use. Heat pumps make a huge difference um, to old school um, uh, electrical heaters. And if you can shift from gas to heat pump, you also reduce the gas fugitive emissions, which are a big problem in, in climate change. And finally, that's for residences, so this is for households. We think those same grants and loans can be really effective for manufacturing and tourism economy. So just to give you one example of that, there's a company, a tourism company in Townsville that has a boiler that costs them $100,000 a year in electricity costs. The upgrade would cost them a quarter of a million and it would cut their electricity costs to a third. So they go from spending $100,000 a year to $33,000 a year, it costs them a quarter of a million. Now they're obviously a big em employment and accommodation thing. They don't want to invest right now because of the downturn in tourism, but if the government gave them a loan, they could do that while there's no one staying at the place. They could do the works they need to do. It would massively reduce their energy bill and the amount of energy they're using. And it would also help um, these companies in times of need. So all of these things are about stimulating the economy, about creating jobs, about helping out people who've been worse affected. But what they also do is they leave us with long-term energy advantages in terms of the shift to renewables at the same time. So each of them has been designed to, to lead to, you know, between five and 10 jobs per million dollars invested. So there's a question around if the economics are so persuasive, how are we still stuck in the rut? Like how come we aren't fully there yet? Um, I might give this one to Tim, perhaps, to have a crack first. Yeah, it's... To me, I mean, I, I spend every day studying the energy markets around the world. And to me, it's just really brutally obvious that this transition is unstoppable. It is inevitable. It's technology driven. What we just need to do is have the economics drive home the reality to our politicians who need to get out of the way. Now, they could do what Dave and Emily are talking about and actually facilitate it, or they could just get out of the way because the industry is going to change. We're all going to change. Australia has already invested. Two million households across Australia have put solar on their rooftop in the last decade. We're going to add two and a half gigawatts of rooftop solar just this year in the middle of COVID as private individuals. So Australia per capita has by far the highest uptake of rooftop solar in the world by a factor of five. So Australia is already a leader. The government can't stop this. And ironically, every time they try, individuals are just taking actions in their own right to protect themselves and their families. So it will happen. So the real problem is the incumbent industries. And let me just give you one number. Australia last year exported $120 billion of fossil fuels. That's $120 billion a year of incumbent industry obstacles to transition. And so ultimately, in both sides of our federal government are bought and paid for by the fossil fuel industry. That's my analysis, my conclusion after studying the energy markets for a decade in Australia. Both sides of our politicians are bought and paid for by fossil fuel lobby groups. And so you look at this gas COVID committee, they're talking about 
subsidising a $6 billion pipeline across Australia. I mean, none of us would want a new pipeline. I mean, if you could spend six billion bucks, would a pipeline be in your wish list? It's in Nev Power's wish list. Why? Because he's got a massive gas field in Western Australia that he wants to sell to us at a ridiculously high price and get us to fund it. So Nev Power is pushing gas because he's long gas and he wants us to fund him. It's just a bizarre incumbency issue that controls our politicians. Thanks, if they got Tim. out of the way, the economics would win tomorrow. Thanks, Tim. Can I add, yeah, just add it to Amanda? Yeah, I do want to, Tim and I sometimes disagree on some things. I agree with everything he said in terms of the politics and the vested interests. I probably have a bit more of a traditional social democratic perspective on the role of government um, in that you, we are dealing with an energy system that has been set up in a particular way in terms of very centralised coal-fired electricity plants. There are some big technical issues that need to be overcome in terms of investing in the infrastructure that we've got set up at the moment to enable a decentralised energy source to be, um, to take, for the market to then do its thing. So for at the moment in Northern and Central Queensland, we're kind of reaching the capacity around um, how much renewable energy is being um, fed into the grid. And we actually need to upgrade that infrastructure to either increase the demand for that energy or be able to export that out. So that kind of investment isn't going to necessarily happen through just industry alone. We do need government intervention to build that infrastructure that would then enable industry to get on with the job. So we do require some government intervention. And then the politics and the vested interests keep getting in the way of that happening. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I think this question is also for you, Amanda. So I'm going to um, allow you to, to keep the stage and, and ask you this one. So this one says fossil fuel workers need to transition to new jobs and have equivalent jobs. So like, what do these jobs look like? Uh, and what if we can't pay them the same as what they're currently earning? Yeah, it's a... Um, it's an interesting one. I think there's, there's definitely been a shift in this debate if you compare where things were at with the federal election last year and this year. Um, I'm hearing, like, the head of the engineering school at JCU said openly in a forum we ran last week, coal is dead and he's telling all of his students that they need to invest in the next thing. There's a lot of work being done in regional areas thinking about the future workforce needs and working with TAFE and University around trades in new sectors. So in terms of advanced manufacturing, new digital skills, because, and in renewable energy as well, they've done, there's a few smart renewable energy training centres that are being set up in regional Queensland. So I think the demand is actually falling, like kids, people are telling their kids not to go into that. So I think there's a misconception about how much people love coal jobs. Um, and I think there's a, there's a sense that those jobs aren't going to be there forever. There's a debate around how long they're going to be there. So the discussion is moving towards actually, do you want a job at all? Because there's a sense that those coal jobs aren't going to be there. The biggest issue and stumbling block at the moment in the discussion is the type of jobs in, the, in terms of length of like a lot of the renewable energy jobs do tend to be in construction. So they are shorter term jobs. People aren't getting paid as well. There's not such good working conditions. That to me is a question around policy and regulation that we're making sure we've got good workplace um, in uh, conditions in place, but also having a discussion about the fact if we're going to reach 50% renewable energy target by 2030, there is a lot of work to do. It's actually a matter of how we plan that workforce um, and that we've got enough people in those jobs because we actually don't have enough people in those jobs at the moment. So there's, there are plenty of jobs to do. It's, and those jobs of the past aren't going to be there for much longer. So I think the discussion is starting to shift. And we've got to remember that there aren't that many people working in coal, despite what the Murdoch media actually tells us. So we're talking up to 6% of jobs in across thermal and coking coal in Queensland, and they're very concentrated around Isaac, um, north of Mackay, not across the state. Thanks. Anything you wanted to respond to in that, Tim? You don't need to, if you don't want to. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I was just going to say that the CEO of BP just in totally endorsed what Amanda just said. Um, he came out, Bernard Looney, last week and said BP is really struggling to attract bright new graduates into its company because they're a fossil fuel company. It's not that they're a coal company, they're a fossil fuel company. And he said, 
the young are not stupid. They realize this is a dying industry and they don't want to be part of it. So Bernard Looney said the only way BP can survive is to transition his entire company, to decarbonize, to go with the uh, inevitable technology disruption, and that way you'll get the best and brightest coming back to his firm. So he agrees with Amanda 100%, and I agree with him and Amanda. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to combine a couple of questions and see which of you wants to answer. But there's one question around like, how do we recycle and replace solar panels? Uh, and there's another one about why do we need more battery storage? Um, and there was specific, particular reference to South Australia um, and the big blackouts that happened there. So do either of you feel like you want to take either of those questions? Amanda, do you want to go first? No? Okay. Um, yeah, we talked in our breakout about recycling. Um, very much as Amanda said, we need governments to set the regulations. We need the, the government to set the framework and then, in my view, private industry can do the heavy lifting. In recycling, it's absolutely critical that we incorporate a end-of-life recycling plan for solar and for wind and for batteries, for lithium-ion batteries. We've already got it in lead-acid batteries. We need it in solar modules. Now, all of our modules are imported. Um, and so all the electricians, they're not gonna be responsible for end of life disposal. So it's up to the government now to actually have an industry body. All of the major solar module manufacturing companies in the world are endorsing that. They are happy to pay for it because they know it'll be the bane of their life in 25 years when we've got literally billions of solar modules going into landfill if we don't have a, a recycling program. But we absolutely need the government to actually provide that framework. And it can be done and it can be done very cheaply and efficiently, but it needs to be done. There's also lots of really good research and development into um, later generation solar panels. So it's also a very good case for continuing to fund our universities, um, seeing as Australia has a good track record in developing the first solar panels in the world. So there's a lot of work that can be done to develop different kinds of solar, solar panels as well. And Emily, as to the second question, why do we need batteries? Um, because it's a bit like we, we have water 24 seven, but it's not raining all the time. We have electricity needs, we have energy needs all of the time or most of the time. And that's not always when it's sunny or when it's windy. So we need to actually be able to time shift the production from the middle of the day when it's really sunny or when it's really windy to the time when we actually need it. So flexible demand requires flexible supply. Uh, that does not mean baseload. Baseload is last century's solution to this century's problem. We need something that manages the grid demand supply balance. So batteries, pumped hydro storage, interstate grid connectivity, even gas peakers, I'll say that, are going to play a role. But um, what we're seeing now in the technology development is that even gas peakers these days are being designed to be able to run on either fossil gas or green hydrogen because for the next 10 years, they're gonna run gas peakers on fossil gas, but we need to get to net zero emissions. So anyone building a gas peaker knows it's gonna last for 40 years. So they actually wanna have a turbine that can be blended in with green hydrogen. So it is a zero emissions gas peaker. And so peakers will play a key role, but they'll be hydrogen peakers in 20 years from now. So it'll be gas peakers, it'll be batteries, it'll be pumped hydro storage, it'll be electric vehicles and it'll be demand response management. We need all of those and who knows what's gonna be the winner, but I like the fact we've got six solutions to a problem. Let's uh, go with all of them and have a diverse, strong, stable, decarbonized, cheap grid. Thank you. Do you wanna add anything, Amanda? Um, I just had someone clarify in the chat that maybe that question was about why don't we make more batteries rather than why don't we have more batteries? 
Yeah, there's a proposal which has been going now for three years to do a battery factory in Townsville. Um, absolutely. I, I, part of the reason we're doing the study on Gladstone is to say we should be actually doing onshore manufacturing. COVID has highlighted the importance of national security as well as energy security. We need, and our federal government is at least thinking about the national security implications of no longer being a manufacturer. And one of the core industries is aluminium. Aluminium is just molten um, electricity, sorry, solidified electricity. It's 13 parts electricity, one part aluminium. And then when you think about what is it, we're the biggest producer of bauxite in the world. We're the, one of the biggest producers of alumina in the world, which is processed bauxite. We're also one of the biggest producers of aluminium, but all of our aluminium is really, really high carbon intensity. What we need to do is decarbonize the aluminium, do the processing and export it. So it'll be cheap, renewable, decarbonized energy driving it. Now that same process goes for steel, it can go for cement, it can go for glass, it can go for battery manufacturing. We should be doing all of this onshore. We need a strategic plan and that has to come from the government. Thanks, Tim. Uh, we're pretty well at time for questions, but Amanda, did you have anything, any last words? Um, something I forgot to mention before is on Thursday, we're releasing a very detailed report that has the full list of all the ideas that came out of the consultation we've done over the last 12 months. So I'll make sure I send it through to Emily so that you all have the link to that and we'll be doing yeah. a detailed um, webinar on that. So if you're interested in a bit more detail and the breakdown of what came out of different regions, um, you'll find out about it. Excellent. And uh, Tim, I'll just do a plug for a report. You hopefully all saw BZE released a the Million Jobs Plan, and that was all about actually how do we build jobs through this COVID recovery period. So I don't work for BZE, but it was a great report. It's a great idea. It's talking about looking forward and how do we stimulate our economy and drive jobs and sustainable growth. So worth a read as well. Thanks, Tim. Um, so BZE is Beyond Zero Emissions, and I'll try and remember to put that in a follow-up email to all of you as well. Um, Tammy's question, I think, is I could probably answer it quite quickly. Um, and so, yeah, so Dave said earlier there was a mandate on existing companies, and so I think I can answer that pretty quickly. The Clean Co is um, the state-owned company um, that is mandated with producing renewable energy currently, and um, both CS and Stanwall want to produce renewable energy, we don't have the mandate, and so we're suggesting that we want to change it. I'm not sure how it came to be that, um, like, the way that it is currently. Oh, Amanda knows, you go for it. Um, yeah, so the, I think the logic initially was if we just left it to the existing power station owners that have mostly coal and some gas assets, to just invest in renewable energy in their own time, that they wouldn't do that without some competition. So the idea of setting up Cleanco is wholly focused on renewable energy, kind of set up the competition and to move fast into the market and get some projects up and running. Um, once that's happened, now the other energy companies are saying, well, we, need, we know we need to move too, because if we don't capture the market now, we're gonna be locked out. Um, so the idea initially was to give Cleanco at least 12 months where they could start investing and get a head start on that and start attracting more private investment in because their initial money that they had set up wasn't actually enough in and of itself to do very much at all. So it was to get that ball rolling. So now Stanwell and CS Energy are saying, well, what about us? We need to invest now too, we're gonna to get locked out. Cool, thank you very much. I would love to see all of you next week. So next week we're back to the, the Tuesdays. Um, from 6.30 to 8 p.m. we'll be talking about jobs-based stimulus and we'll be joined by Laura Barnes from um, Australia together. So um, thanks everyone for your time this evening. I, I learned a lot and I've been thinking about climate change for a long time. So thanks to Tim and Amanda and our other speakers this evening and all of you for your time and your questions and your attention. Um, have a good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.
Thanks to everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, Emily. Bye.